Of course, I kept assuring myself of the farcical nature of the whole affair. But even as I did so, and here we come to what now, with hindsight, I find most upsetting and most revealing, I began to see the three sentences on the postcard through the eyes of my interrogators. I myself began to feel outraged by my words, and to fear that something serious did in fact lurk behind their comedy. To know that I never really had been one with the body of the party, that I had never been a true proletarian revolutionary, that I had gone over to the revolutionaries on the basis of a simple decision. We felt participation in the proletarian revolutionary movement to be, so to speak, not a matter of choice, but a matter of essence. A man either was a revolutionary, in which case he completely merged with the movement into one collective entity, or he was not, and could only want to be one. In that case, he would always consider himself guilty of not being one. Hi, this is Nathan. This is David. And this is Nick. And welcome to another episode of the Books of Some Substance podcast, where today we're talking about Milan Kundera's first novel, The Joke. So this book was published in uh, 1967 in Czechoslovakia. Um, it kind of has a cast of characters. It's written in these very interesting individual pieces from the char- individual character's perspective. So central character Ludwig who is uh, basically a member of the Communist Party, who's kind of got a little bit of an individualist streak, gets kicked out for making the joke, hence the title of the book, and it sort of ruins his life. Uh, Another character, Helena, ends up being the target of basically all of Ludwig's fury and wrath as he tries to avenge uh, being kicked out of the party and the wreck that his life that has become. And then also weaved in is Jaroslav, who is... Ludwig's childhood friend, a uh, member of a Moravian folk ensemble who also sort of lives in this split between the old world and the fantasy world and the sort of newer Czechoslovakia. And he chooses to kind of ride that, that fantasy, if you will, as a way of protecting himself against the other realities. And then we also have Kostka, who is uh, basically an ostracized ex-party member who has a sort of Christian view And this ends up being the thing that pushes him out of the Communist Party. And so basically, Kundera weaves all these together in this uh, very interesting kind of almost musical way where you get each character's individual perspective. They're written from different standpoints. uh, Then eventually he combines them all together at the end. And it's almost like this big metaphor for the folk music uh, style that he keeps evoking um, throughout the novel. And so I guess my question to start off for you guys is that we have a lot of stuff in here. We have a really unique writing style. We have a lot of political content. We have honestly kind of a love story or a failed love story or a tragedy or a comedy. So I guess if we've interpreted this novel as a Western audience, as a mainly political novel, how do you think that stands up? Is that how you see it? Are you saying that that's, uh, historically, that's how it's been received uh, by the American audience as a as a sort of political condemnation of Sovietism. Yes, and that's kind of you know I have I have a foreword written by Kundera himself where he talks about you know how Western audiences needed to view this as being against Stalinism and against communism, and they kind of missed the rest of the novel. But when I read this today, I still see so much political content that honestly reminds me of stuff that's happening in the U.S. And so it's hard for me to view it not as a political novel, but then I also sort mm-hmm. of see all these other elements, like I said, the style and the characters. And it's it's easy to say, yeah, it's, it's absolutely not about the politics. <laughs> I don't think there's any way to read this as not a political novel. And I, I, we've mentioned this, this idea a, a few times, the idea of authorial intent or the, the fallacy of the author, where you're, it's, you're not supposed to care about what the author thinks or says that they tried to do. It's what the book actually does. And whether or not Kundera is maybe playing on that idea, I mean, there's, there, don't, don't get me wrong, there are definitely other elements in this book, but every interaction between characters, every other plot element all revolves around what happened as a result of large communist collectivist influence on these characters' lives. And it's always Mm -hmm. there. It's always present in everything that's happening in the book. That doesn't mean that it doesn't focus on other things, 
but it's it's so hard not to read this as a political novel not only because it's behind everything but it's also in the forefront i mean there's the largest section of the book is all about the result of this joke and him sent to this sort of workers unit in the military and the fallout of his life so i mean it would be impossible to read this book not politically i think i think I don't know that I agree with that exactly. I mean, there's so much, there is so much, I agree with that there's so much about it that is political and it's, it's, you can't take that out of it. But I think that there are, there are themes that transcend the political. You know, I think you could, you could look at it as a critique of communism or Sovietism or collectivism. But I think there's also a critique more broadly of modernism and what, and they're posing the question of what role does religion, spirituality, su- superstition, folklore mythology play in a modern world to give meaning to it and so you know in some regard communism is that is the the spearhead of modernism in this novel but i i guess i i could see the point of like not wanting to just pigeonhole it as a political novel because maybe that makes it seem it loses the very uh, the other themes and the very human humane aspect of it as well yeah, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, I mean, I like both of your splits on this um, because I, I really like when I started reading this, I was kind of freaked out a little bit about how much it nails <laughs> just this, like you know, the 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 collective, right? Like how yeah. terrifying this stuff can be. Like it really is. It's it's herd mentality. It's it really started to shake me. And then I guess like in trying to view this thing through you know the lens of being a work of fiction. And focusing on character interactions and the other philosophies built into this is kind of where I I was trying on that concept of Kundera saying it's not really a political novel, it's just a novel. Because once you get outside that initial political situation, I think kind of to what Nathan was saying and like how I read this is it's really like the classical thing is just like a character's agency and our own, like in the real world, our own freedoms and how much we're really in charge of that and responsible for that and how, you know, what we do to preserve that versus what we acquiesce and what we give into. And, you know, there's so many concepts in here that I love and a lot of it's just the decay and the act of history becoming myth and the forgetting of all of these concepts and how it really doesn't even matter. It all becomes just trivial at the end. And so, so many of these things that we dug in for didn't really matter at the end. It was empty to start with. And so by hanging on to that, you've basically extended how trivial it was to start. And so I think of those concepts as the setting is political, but then these are easily ported into, you know, just general character interactions and that wonderful frailty of the human mind that, uh, you know, it's kind of my favorite subject in fiction, probably, yes. how we all succumb to how just hard life is, man. It's just hard. Yeah, but I think even what you just said is, oddly enough, still today, a political statement in some way, right? You talked about characters' individual agency, which is something that is, is a big part of this book. It's a part of all novels. I think that's kind of why we read them. We read how individuals go through and deal with a struggle of some kind, right? And I think what Nathan talked about is this idea of modernism versus spirituality. I think that's where the book, it goes. Like, it, it moves into that, right? And part of what, I know we're jumping ahead. <laughs> we tend to jump to the end. But... <laughs> Always do. <laughs> what a kind of Ludwig's <laughs> growth <laughs> is, this, this, he's trying to let, in some ways he can't help but let go of it because he realizes it brings him no satisfaction. But there's this movement of focus on the political, on the environment, trying to find, trying to move into something else. Whether or not the novel fully succeeds in doing that, we can talk about. I think we might get into that. But I think by the second half of the novel, once we're back in the small town, once the uh, festival of the festival of the kings, uh, the ride, the ride of the ride, the ride of the ride of the, ride of the kings. Yeah. So once the ride of the kings kind of gets underway, he has his his really final and rather boring, dull confrontation with Pavel. Yeah. And we get sort of sucked into the the folklore and the the music of Moravia, like yeah, we see that shift of kind of this political focus into a, a search for some sort of meaning beyond those things, into some sort of greater spiritual connection. I think 
I would also just like to interject that the whole reason we read this book was <laughs> a text message from Nathan saying that he didn't want to read anything political and that he wanted to read something uplifting. And this book is insanely political. And uh, we could talk about whether it's uplifting. I think it's fucking not. But the premise of this request denied. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the funny thing is, though, that I feel completely <laughs> satisfied by it. Like, this is exactly what I wanted to read. And maybe I just didn't actually know what I wanted. Because there, what I really enjoy, I, I love this book. I really, really enjoyed it. Yeah, it's amazing. And it, it really gave me what I was looking for, which is like, sometimes stuff is messed up sometimes stuff is complicated and there's this like simmering beauty through the whole thing there's like this magic through the whole thing it's like and it's right there i I just i love his the way that he partly through these different characters and like giving you different characters perspectives on the same the same events just giving you giving the reader a sense of it's hard to call ambiguity beautiful because Oftentimes ambiguity is frustrating, but I feel like in his writing, it just, the, the heaviness of the subject matter just kind of seems to just dissolve and float away. Ambiguity can be beautiful if it is cut through with some sort of hope, which is kind of maybe where I don't know. Like you mentioned that there is this sense of, there's like some sort of magical elements or some, something along those lines sort of behind it. And I'm going to ask you where that is because. To me, that's a hard thing to, like, I can sense that desire and I can kind of feel it, but I'm having a hard time finding it in the book, in the story. Where is it? Because, like, there's just so much heartbreak and disappointment and people being yeah. lied to and used. <laughs> I, I, like, it is. So there's this, there's a beautiful scene, which is actually uh, Kundera said that this is where the whole novel came from, is he, he observed... Uh, Peasant? Are they peasants? Um, a poor you, woman are. stealing flowers, <laughs> <laughs> stealing flowers from a grave. He saw that, and he's like, "Wow, this is really interesting. What would motivate this person to steal flowers from a grave?" Um, and then that's an event in the book. I, I don't know. We've mentioned the character uh, Lucy, but she she's one of the most significant characters. She doesn't get her own section, but um, Ludwig. She's kind of a foil for several of the characters. Um, and I think a very important character that I'd love to get everybody's take on. But she steals flowers from this grave to give to Ludwig to kind of try to bring beauty into their very, very extremely bleak lives. And that's a very depressing image. But what she does with those flowers, she de- decorates her room with them so that when he comes and they intend to make love for the first time, she tries to make something special out of this. And what Ludwig describes entering that is that he feels like he's in a different, he feels like he's in another place and he kind of accepts that illusion for a minute. Mm. So that, that, that's one example. Yeah. And then nice. I think, I think the the scene at the end where they're playing music together um, and he finally, he Ludwig kind of comes back to his sense of meaning yeah. in life. There, there's he, some he beauty there. To pursue this modernism. Until those darn youngsters show up. <laughs> well, I love that too. It's yeah, like I know. Nothing, I agree. It's not perfect, you know. Yeah, yeah. It, it strikes. It, I mean, it strikes such a wonderful note with me that the balancing, uh, the, the balancing act that he plays between cynicism and belief and beauty and bleakness. Yeah, yeah. I think the the magic comes in that kind of end acceptance. And there's a line in here, uh, it's like the last page, uh, where he says, I was struck by the thought that a person's destiny often ends before his death. And honestly, that was one of the more moving comments or quotes of the entire book for me, which is just that, you know, in any tragedy, in any sort of, um, you know, narrative arc, we as a reader, uh, and also in real life, we want, we want these things to coincide. We want a destiny to be arrived at at the end. If somebody's going to meet their maker, that should be the end point. But his point is that a lot of these things are decided in the middle of life, and then you still have the rest of life to live out. And that's kind of what what the arc of Ludwig went through, which is that he met his destiny in the middle of his life, and he still has the rest. He tried to avenge basically the one act that 
basically screwed up everything about what he had going for him. And when he realized that how laughable that was and how he actually was the one who lost even further, he kind of had nothing else to do but just to accept it. And I think that's that concept is pretty is pretty magical if you overlook all of the preceding horrible things not just done to a character but also importantly and i think this is uh we can get into the the translations and the censorship and stuff around this book but also the horrible things that a character does ludwig is a pretty shitty dude a lot of bad stuff came out of that guy and another thing of why this novel was sort of interpreted by western audience from a political standpoint is that they started to kind of censor some of that and cut some of Mm. it in order to in my opinion or in my guess to kind of give it more of the political leaning that they wanted to which is that when a western audience would read this they wouldn't see things about rape they wouldn't see things about um, things that didn't fit nicely into an anti-communist narrative was this the first translation that appeared in 69 that had the edits to it or the yeah so the censored? i think that yeah i think the history of this is that um so it was published uh in czechoslovakia uh in 67 when prague spring happened in 68 it kind of got censored but at that point it was being um translated and published elsewhere in europe um but different versions specifically the english versions i think the first british one had actually the wrong number of chapters and they were in a different order and they had cut a lot of those uh really bad details and um you know, my interpretation of that, like I said, is is basically they wanted it to be a political novel. Mm-hmm. And then there was a professor in America who was like, wait a second, you guys are cutting out some of this stuff that Kundera put in that basically makes it, you know, a more rounded thing that gives it less of a political bent and more of a true novel thing. And so the edition that I have, which is, uh, I think it was in the mid 80s. Um, restores a lot of that but i understand you guys have an even newer even more definitive version um but essentially uh, you know as as works get translated and as these things um you know have to work through censorship and stuff like that uh, i find it such an interesting concept that the actual arc of a novel and the order of it and the content can be wildly different (laughs) and the readership doesn't even know yeah right yeah and also, um, I, now I, I sort of feel dirty that you guys read the definitive <laughs> translation and I read something from the 80s because I bought this in a used bookstore. And I'm just like, did I miss some important shit no, too? No, I think you got to the idea. So Kundera, at the end, we have an author's note and he's talking about your edition that you were reading that at first he signed off on, but then later he started to read it. And he, he noticed and he makes this note. He said... Um, there was inaccuracy in all the reflective passages. Irony had been transformed into satire. Unusual turns of phrase had been obliterated. The distinctive voices of the characters, narrators, had been altered to the extent of altering their personality. Thus, Ludwig, that thoughtful, melancholy intellectual, became vulgar and cynical. But mm. I think even though hmm. maybe Nick in general tends to read things as vulgar and cynical because that's who he is, maybe... <laughs> but I think he still he caught like something you, you you mentioned just before we started talking about the translation was that and not to sound like a you know an Instagram influence self help huckster but there is that spark of hope in acknowledging a, a certain amount of of bullshit in the world and yet still kind of persevering and moving through it and since we've already kind of gone on this sort of road and talked about the end I just want to read a passage that I think gets to Nathan's point and yours, that sort of redeems him in, the, in, in a certain way. And it's again, he's talking about the folk music he's playing with his, his old friend. And he said, I felt happy inside these songs, inside the glass cabin of these songs, where sorrow is not lightness, laughter is not grimace, love is not laughable, and hatred is not timid, where people love with body and soul. Yes, Lucy, with body and soul where they dance in joy, jump into the Danube in despair, where love is still love and pain is pain, where values are not yet devastated. And it seemed to me that inside these songs I was at home, that I'd arrived from them, that if I had betrayed this home, I had only made it all the more my home, because what voice is more plaintive than the voice of the home we have betrayed? But I was equally aware that this home was not of this world, though what kind of home was it if it wasn't of this world? 
that what we were singing and playing were only memories, recollections, an imaginary preservation of something that no longer was, and I felt the ground of this home sinking under my feet, felt myself falling, clarinet in mouth, falling down into the depths of years, the depths of centuries, into the fathomless depths, and I told myself with astonishment that my only home was this descent, this searching, eager fall, and I abandoned myself to it and to my sweet vertigo. That's funny. Can I... I want to juxtapose your self-help huckster passage with my vulgar cynic okay. passage <laughs> because now I'm kind of, now I'm kind of like wait is the tone of my book just completely different and so uh, this is like my favorite passage um, yes suddenly I saw it all clearly most people willingly deceive themselves with a doubly false faith they believe in eternal memory of men things deeds peoples and in rectification of deeds errors sins injustice both are sham. The truth lies at the opposite end of the scale. Everything will be forgotten and nothing will be rectified. All rectification, both vengeance and forgiveness, will be taken over by oblivion. No one will rectify wrongs. All wrongs will be forgotten. And I just like circled the shit out of that. Um, <laughs> is that is that as like dark and and like, I don't know, sort of bleak and prophetic in your guys' copy? I, I wrote that one down actually. It's 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 quite different, actually. The um, interesting. It's quite different. Um, he yeah. uses redressed instead of rectified, for instance. Uh. I, I I do feel like it's a bit softer actually in the later translation. I mean, the concept is still there. Yeah. Interesting. So this is where I recommend to all listeners who are still uh, angsty teenagers that they should read the Michael Henry Heim translation <laughs> because it's full of a lot of cool punk lyrics. And so that one's clearly superior. <laughs> um, but I think that that's an interesting, I mean, that's a critical passage. Um, and it's not as, I didn't read it as, as, as bleak and cynical. I think I, because I think what I, what I took from that is that you want the external world to make sense of your past for you. And that's not going to happen. So, th I mean, this, this is kind of, he tries to exact vengeance on the guy who, who was a friend of his in his youth who basically put him away, who basically was the one who said, yes, you're guilty of betraying the party or whatever, kicked him out of the university, sent him to the mines. And so he try, his plan is, after like a decade, is to seduce his wife, make a fool out of him. Just to be clear, though, it's not like he planned that for the decade and or 15 years. It was more right. happenstance. He was just working and living and he met this woman who happened to be married to this guy who was the leader of the of the sort of trial that accused him of being a Trotskyite and sort yeah. of kicked him out of the party and sent his life into sort of disarray. He, so he hadn't planned it, but he had the that that hateful vengeance in him. Yes. That yes. he had allowed Zemanek to define his life in his hatred of he needed to hate Zemanek. He says that he he how could he tell Zemanek that he needed to hate him? He couldn't he, he would lose all balance if he stopped hating him. And so he tries to exact some sort of vengeance to sort of right his, the wrong in his past by committing another wrong towards Zemanek. And then the whole thing, in, in a fairly comical, tragic way, goes completely wrong. But the lesson, I mean, it, it is that one, like that, that you can't fix it. It's going to be forgotten and you can't fix it. So the only thing you can do is, is, act now and for the future so I, I don't i guess i just don't think it's bleak i think it's actually fair you know kind of moralistic i mean so yeah outside of the different readings and translations and tones that come with it i, I think an important concept that's weaved into the ride of the kings which sort of shows up throughout the novel and there's this section where they talk about what it means right because there's this whole arc of how moravian culture was used by the communist party as basically a way to sort of instill kind of some nationalism, essentially. And Yaroslav, at some point, uh, when Ludwig is a member of the party and they're trying to kind of get the folk music and everything more widely adopted and kind of kicking out the Western influence, all the jazz, he makes a comment. He's like, this doesn't make any sense. Why are they, why are they trying to access this music and this culture? This is something that only the most uh, conservative Moravian patriots would do. So you kind of already get a flavor for that political side of how these things can be co-opted and, and used as tools, right? 
Um, but then as the book goes into the Riot of the Kings and uh, its attempt at explaining the history amongst the characters, they understand that they don't really know what it means. It's just a ritual. And basically history has filtered out the meaning of it. And so they kind of exchange different ideas. And so now it's just this tactile thing that they do, but they don't know why they do it or what it's supposed to symbolize. And I feel like that passage at the end that we're kind of circulating on, I think that's almost like the the positive of it, which is that some things just continue to exist, but they actually get stripped of their meaning or history actually becomes myth because it's impossible for all of these details and all of these things to remain with it. And so while I wrote in caps, nothing will be rectified, all will be forgotten um, <laughs> as something that I felt to be kind of, I don't know, something that I would very clearly chant. Um, <laughs> Maybe will, it's more will of, chant? <laughs> yes, yes. Already uh, working on that song? <laughs> uh, I mean, Concept Record is done right now. That's an excellent title. Um, yeah, I think I think that's more of like the if we're getting back to that underlying magic thing. It's just that the decay and the the filter that all history, all of our actions, everything run through, is extremely lossy. Like this stuff yeah. just gets lost. It well, doesn't make it through. It doesn't hold uh, its original form. And there's something that's very horrifying about that. But there's also something very kind of beautiful, or yeah. or you can console yourself with that concept. Maybe we can talk a little bit about the format of this book, which is obviously very deliberate. But as kind of a segue, all of these characters, whatever four characters who have sections dedicated to them, I think represent a very distinct, you know, they live in the same era, but they represent a very distinct relationship with their environment, with communism, I guess, specifically. Uh, Ludwig is ultimately a cynic and a, and a prankster, I think, but was dedicated, but basically has a very strong individualist streak. He kind of can't attach himself to anything. Uh, I mean, you went through these, there's the Christian, there's the, uh, the folklorist. Um, and Helena is a little bit harder to describe exactly what her worldview is. I mean, if you want to, in terms of relationship to the outside world, she's a good party member. Yeah. And she's someone who holds on sense. to the past of the revolution like she she praises it she holds on to this nostalgia of like singing these these anthems and these songs you mm -hmm. know and she talks about she yeah. has a line she has a line that says um uh, like she's talking about how her her husband who was the man that en ended up putting Ludwig away or sending him away and he he was sort of getting fed up with different aspects of the party and now he has this cushy job teaching marxism which is kind of funny to the to the youth <laughs> and he you know he would he might speak out or say something and get a little rap on the knuckles i think is how she phrased it and she says but something did remain behind a germ of apathy she's talking about in him i think uh, mistrust misgiving a germ that reproduced a silence in secret i didn't know how to counter it i just clung to the party more tightly than ever the party is almost like a living being. I can tell it all my most intimate thoughts now that I have nothing to say to Pavel. And there's a few instances where she talks about how she's very upset with the private self and the public self and how it should all be this one thing because if you're a party member and you're a good party member, you shouldn't have a private self. You should just exist mm -hmm. and be a part of the party, a part of the... The collective. And in that way, that's kind of how she's sort of portrayed. She's portrayed as a bit of a ridiculous figure, which is why, I don't know about you, but I do feel bad for her, but the novel does not treat her well. <laughs> she's, she's a joke throughout, even though she's being used. Her husband doesn't love her. He's sleeping with one of his students, it seems to be like, near the end of the book. In, in her anger at, at being used by uh, Ludwig, she ends up taking a bunch of pills from this this young guy who has stomach problems and hid hid his... Uh, uh, his laxatives? laxatives? Yeah, he hid his laxatives in a different pill jar, so she takes all these things to, to commit suicide, and she ends up just spending all this time in this outhouse because she's <laughs> sh shitting herself constantly. It's, it's, uh, it's a very... <laughs> funny but also very very uh it, it's not a pleasant view of her like there's really nothing yeah 
So this is that's perfect. And I, I actually, you know, Helena's chapters, I think the second chapter. And I was like, who is this person? I, she she doesn't kind of play into Ludwig's story until near the end of the book. And I didn't think about that first chapter in the context of actually finding out who she is, who she's married to, and what the significance of this is to the story. And it just makes it even better. But what I was going to say was that, so you see all these people engaging with a very different ways with communism and their era. And then at the end, the student, who's the, the student that, that Zemanek is sleeping with, she basically dismisses all of them as the same. And Ludwig is just kind of like, holy shit, we're all the same. Like, <laughs> yes, every, all that the differences is the best. in our lives are all the same compared to the next generation. Yeah. I mean, honestly, this is what this is like. Uh, this is the perfect summary of everything is that you can be so deep into a thing and the divisions and yeah. the differences and all this stuff. And then someone, I mean, he's got some, he's got some like observations and stuff about uh, youth in general that I think are pretty spot <laughs> yeah, on, he does. but this could just be an outside observer. Like you get so wrapped up in these things and then somebody just goes, I can't tell it apart. And it just <laughs> completely makes the entire thing banal. Yeah. Like everything yeah. that you've been fighting, these, these concepts of like, you know, solidarity versus rebellion versus individuality and, and rebellion versus counter rebellion. Like all these are just in your head. History, when viewed from the outside, it's just going to be glossed over. They're just going to, they're just going to wipe it. <laughs> I, I know Nick, you and I both have shared the pleasure, of, I guess pleasure of uh, teaching a bunch of college kids, like young, I think. I don't know if, <laughs> if your students were young, but like you, you sit around a bunch of like freshman, sophomore college kids and talk about things that you care about and they don't fucking care they like to them <laughs> like yeah, any of that stuff can't. it's just this blur of the past for the most part and yeah there's this really yeah. there's this sense of disdain especially on ludwig's part he he rips into the youth a lot uh and then at the end the, yeah this young woman's like ah eh, you guys all did the same thing you all acted the same way yeah you were on different sides but whatever it's it's that's the past. Like, there's this sort of indifference to past nuance as being, you can just sort of wrap it up as this one thing and move on from that. Exactly. Which I, I think the book is kind of critiquing a little bit, but also, also holding up as kind of true. <laughs> yeah. It, it's a strange combination. There, there's definitely some nuance in that thought. But I think it comes back to that quote that, that Nick read everything will be forgotten and nothing will be redressed. Yeah. And that's that's reality. And so what are you going to do? If everything's going to be forgotten, you're the only one carrying this around. Ludwig is the only one carrying that past around and he let it ruin his life. Semenek actually moved on, liberalized, you know, kind of seemed to become, I mean, in spite of the fact that he's cheating on his wife with a young student, seemed to become more or less a decent person versus Ludwig was like, bitter and just wanted to hurt everybody around him and i think it, it presented as as sort of the opposite somebody who lives a parallel life has parallel experiences with ludwig but kind of takes the opposite approach to it uh Koska, um the christian who basically never fights against any of his accusations he accepts all of them he actually resigns he doesn't go to trial he he asks to be moved into a farm and gets taken advantage of all the time but just moves with it um, accepts it as as God's will, and seems um, to end up having a pretty decent life. Like he likes his job at the hospital. Right. He's got a girl in another town. He's he seems all right, you know. Like, and he he sort of judges uh, Ludwig in the beginning for for being for wanting. There's this inter interchange with about like destruction, and and Ludwig calls him mm. like a happy builder of God's structures or something you know what i'm talking about this interchange between the two of them yeah i i don't think i can find it but i know what you're talking about yeah and th at the end of uh Koska's section he's kind of reflecting on uh ludwig who kind of has suddenly come back into his life eh, coincidentally to exact his revenge but Koska, kind of talking to himself about uh ludwig says to be because to live in a world in which no one is forgiven, where all are irredeemable, is the same as living in hell. Which I think, I, I think forgiveness is the only answer to the question raised of everything is forgotten and nothing is redressed. Forgiveness is the only way to move into the future. Is the only way to not live in that in that past hell. Yeah, it's either forgiveness or complete forgetting. Yeah, because yeah. because holding on to it's right. not going to work. 
I, I think it's curious that Kundera, when he wrote this book, was still a member of the Communist Party. Like he was, he was actually kicked out of the party for anti-party behavior, um, but came back into the party and actually like defended the Communist Party and defended communism. Was still defending communism at this point. But in this book, like he reserves all of his ire for the communists. Yeah, well, I think he, well, one of the things that I think he does really well is he, he highlights the individual in the collective and, you know, whether it's communism or fascism or whatever sort of extreme end, you know, there's always this sort of bootlicking individual who just does whatever to stay in favor and really doesn't authentically believe anything um, and just sort of adapts and follows orders and uses that as a way to sort of build up themselves. And it's kind of why communism ultimately breaks down is because it is about the individual, right? It's their ability to work within this specific system. And that's why you have people who rise up in communism who have different levels of power and all that, which is kind of the opposite of what it's supposed to be. And I think his ability of highlighting how that has its own I don't even want to say corruption because then that feels like he's making an extreme political statement, but it's more like just highlighting how individuals operate in big organizational structures. I mean, if you ever work for a big company or been part of a big government organization, you know, private versus civil, like just once something gets big, there's a certain individual who sort of like just slithers around in there. <laughs> And doesn't really, they're not really great at what they do, but they just sort of keep living on forever. And you can see that it's not really authentic, but they just know how to do exactly the right thing at the right time. And if you believe in anything too hard, you'll actually just shoot yourself in the foot and yourself will get kicked out. I think Kundera, to Nathan's point, may not have been totally against the concept of communism. He was against the concept of what the individual could operate within the fake veil of communism and that's kind of what he saw and that's what he was poking apart it was not necessarily like a political statement about the system but just pointing out that here's what these individuals are actually doing within it and here's some of the contradictions and paradoxes and and the laughter that ensues after that yeah maybe uh, but again that's a hard statement to make if i've only read this book of his cuz yeah nothing about Nothing about the party or the system or the people who participate in it come out in a positive light. Even the true believers, like Alexa, who gives his father up and who ends up becoming so rigid in his dogmatism that he he ends up in the prison camp as well and ends up committing suicide. And that the people that do... The only way to exist within the party is to sort of just not get too attached to it. And which is why I think um, Yaroslava, his main interest is in holding on to his past and dreaming of like ancient and historical glory and imagining folk music and con his connection to that. And the whole like the idea of the party is secondary to him. He doesn't really mm -hmm. hold on to it. And he, but even then, like he still has a pretty unhappy life. His wife. And his child don't have any interest in what he's interested in. And he's kind of alone. Uh, sorry, just to go back. So, Nathan, you say that he was a member of the party for a long time afterwards. And he still sort of held on to the beliefs. Again, I, I haven't read anything about that, so I, I wouldn't know. But if all I'm looking at is this book, it's very easy to see how people, especially in the older editions, could read this book and see it as being primarily an anti-communist novel. I don't think it. That's mm -hmm. all it is. I, but I still, but I still think that that's there. Like, there's no way to read this and come away going, you know what? That sounded good. I think that would be a nice yeah, system like to live within. Well, yeah, yeah. About it. there's, there's a lot of ambivalence, but it really seems like he's really not ambivalent about collective behavior. No. Yeah, and I think I think that's exactly right. It's the, yeah. It's the, yeah. <laughs> yeah, unconditional <laughs> condemnation of collective behavior yeah. and. The individuals that can operate within that, right? Yeah. And yeah, I yeah, I mean, I'm I'm completely same page. I, I agree with all that stuff. Um, it's just going back to our whole original like conversation and statement about is this political? Is it not political? It's that this is very clearly the topic of the book and the setting of the book, but just his ability to kind of 
break down individuals' philosophies and agency and have that be something that I can easily apply to my scenario, which is not I'm not in a communist government, right? I'm not in 1960s Czechoslovakia, mm-hmm. but still be very identifiable and very, I don't want to say inspirational because that makes it seem positive, but more of like, holy shit, he's like, he's hitting the nail on the head right now perfectly. And I can look at a bunch of different categories of my life that I interact with where this is very applicable. Mm-hmm. That I think is kind of the wow factor of this. And it's, it's almost why like I was thinking about, you know, we did Camus, um, uh, previously when we were talking about the concept of the philosophical novel and how like your Sartre's and your Camus are, a lot of them are pretty flawed because they're just like, uh, like ideas that have a thin veneer of a novel around it. And I actually think after reading this, that this might be like the book that I would throw out there as the example of like what a philosophical novel should be. Heck yes. Right. It is fundamentally a novel, but it has so much philosophical content in it. And yes, it's wrapped up in a bunch of political stuff. Um, but like this has this has little like emotions and like as you read the things that these characters go through, whether it's really horrifying shit or how horrifying some of like the trivial banal is, that's equally terrifying in my book. Um like that has so much more of an impact than, you know, reading some Camus or like even Sartre's nausea, which I am a huge fan of. But like those are just very like that's like one idea. Uh, Kundera has all of this stuff wrapped up and actually gives it humanity. And I think that's, that's where this whole thing excels. Nailed it. (laughs) (laughs) Swish. It's funny that that you compare it to to Camus because there's something that Kundera does a lot, which is, I think that's why it's so quotable is kind of step outside of, even though it's all written in first person, step outside of what's happening and observe it, you know, as a, an idea and basically just express an idea like modern man cheats. He tries to get around all the milestones on the road from birth to death. That's not about what's happening. That's just an observation that a philosophical observation that you can, you know, agree with, disagree with, discuss, whatever. And he does that constantly, just kind of steps out of the action, makes an observation. And I think Camus did that a lot as well in the plague. And I didn't like it. I mean, I like the plague. Okay. But it just kind of seemed to break it up. And I didn't have that feeling with Kundera. The whole thing really holds together to me. Yeah, I agree. And I, I just want to read one that I, I marked about uh, his comments. I sort of alluded to this earlier on youth. But this this was so perfect for me. Uh, so he says, The young can't help acting. They're thrust immature into a mature world and must act mature. They therefore adopt the forms, patterns, and models of anyone who appeals to them, seems fashionable enough, and suits their purposes and try to act like him. And he goes on and kind of describes the behaviors of the quote unquote boy commander. And I just like, I run all that through. It's just, it's perfect to a T. It reminds me, like I said, of working a big organization, teaching in a big organization, my own behaviors when I've been, you know, younger than I am now, which is, I'm still kind of young right now anyway. But like the things that I'm like kind of ashamed, I don't want anybody to, (laughs) to find out that I don't know what I'm talking about. So I try to emulate the behavior of other people but knowing that older people will probably see through that and they're just like, oh, he's just doing stupid boy commander <laughs> stuff. Like it both like called me out and then also made me angry to like seeing that other character in my regular life. And I think that's like what Nathan's getting at is that these examples, they're weaved in, but they have just, they're, they're just as philosophically good and just as uh, like observationally good, but they just fit the narrative much more smoothly and in a, in a much more like accessible form. Yeah, I, I want to kind of, keep that quote going although when you read it i could really tell the difference in the translation but further down on the page where you go into the boy commander stuff youth is terrible it is a stage trod by children in buskins and a variety of costumes mouthing speeches they've memorized and fanatically believe but only half understand (laughs) and history is terrible because it so often ends up a playground for the immature a playground for the young nero a playground for the young bonaparte a playground for easily roused mobs of children whose simulated passions and simplistic poses suddenly metamorph... metamorphous... metamorphize? That's a weird... metamorphous. All right. Just go for it. And simplistic poses (laughs) suddenly metamorph into a catastrophically real reality. Yeah. Yeah. And not to go too far into the the landmines of uh, current political discourse, but, you know, and it's hard not to talk about what's going on today, but Right now, you 
you see there's a lot of people protesting in the streets, there's a lot of real and true grievance, and there's, you know, things that are really fucked up about the world. But in these in these groups, especially amongst youth, and it's not all of them, but there it's it's there in young people, they have this sense of uh, falling into sloganeering, falling into this this idea that they can really be a part of history and 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 change history without really knowing the depth or the nuance of of what it is they're they're rallying against and it's a way for them to sort of feel stronger and better about themselves and like nick i too i too was one of those young people back you know in the early aughts you know protesting war doing these sorts of things right you have this like vague sense of what is happening and you know you're angry about it and you hear people say certain things, you fucking quote those things and being in that collective, being in that group saying those things, it gives you this sense of power and the sense of you are in control of reality. You are in control of, of what's happening. Through, I think it will be true throughout history. So you're right, it's not only... A political novel. I mean, it, the politics are there, but the philosophy b- behind some of these ideas is really what makes this book so good. Yeah, and that. So, so your point about uh, weaving that into you know feeling part of the collective and all that stuff. There's a one sentence from uh, Kundera's intro that I have in mind, where he says, "I still maintain the naive democratic democratic illusion. Americans know it well that no force can withstand the will of the people." And so I think he's. Like the best part about Kundera is he's not, he's not like picking one side or the other. He's, he's evaluating it from different directions because, you know, we talk about like current protests and all this stuff and like, I'm super pissed about a lot of stuff too. I think that I don't necessarily have confidence that anything will change or certainly not change soon. You Um, no longer believe in the ability of history to allow things to be redressed. Well, it's that, yeah, I mean, it's that, it's that naive illusion of the, you know, the democratic will of the people, right? But I think what Kundera does is also the thing that I do, which is that I still fundamentally have to believe it, right? I have to believe that these things matter, even though I don't think that these actions will necessarily create something that is going to shift. It's basically, you know, uh, expect the best, accept the worst. And so I think that, like, that's what he's going through in this novel is that feeling he's pointing out these behaviors and how how the individual reacts to them and how you know either gives them power or uh if they're on the opposite side they're they're crushed by the collective right but it's almost like he's evaluating how effective it really can or can't be and he's actually pretty objective in that manner and that's what i like about it because as you you know as you really look at these different things as history is a play thing of the young you sort of realize that, yeah, it's almost like who's yelling the loudest and most passionate gets to make the slogan. And once it's the slogan, yeah. then that's the thing that we have to do. And it suddenly loses a lot of the nuance and actual realities of a problem. And then like suddenly it's just people r- repeating a simplified version. And then, well, it's never going to be solved because you've simplified it too much. And so, like, that arc within the Communist Party that he lays out, I think, is is really great, right? It's, it's his joke gets simplified, and then it once it's simplified in a manner, he can't fight it. There's no way that, that he could say that, hey, I was just joking around to this line once they held it up next to, I think, the diaries of, of uh, like, the <laughs> ideal communist, right? Yeah. And and that's that's how I feel about today. You can't, you can't like, say a thing that isn't the, the right thing stance because especially in a says, world without forgiveness which is a quote that nathan came out with earlier that again yes. this is a this is a big issue if if there is no path for forgiveness what are you expecting to change and how do you expect people to change and that's such a, a beautiful concept in this book that you see how ludwig's life is destroyed because he wasn't allowed to be forgiven, and he was not allowing forgiveness of what happened to him. Exactly. I think it's th- and comparing uh, that Casca's you know Christian message of forgiveness with how he observes the the, uh, the revolutionaries, which is uh, you know theoretically atheistic, rationalistic, anti-religious, and he describes it as the revolutionary era from 1948 to 1956 had little in common with skepticism and rationalism 
It was an era of great collective faith. A man who kept in step with this era experienced feelings that were akin to religious ones. He renounced his ego, his person, his private life in favor of something higher, something super personal. They have created a range of ideas that are untouchable and therefore, in our terminology, sacred. That whole, yeah, like the Costco stuff with Christianity and forgiveness and that that concept of of like the uh you know the revolution is this rational super structured thing that doesn't have that mechanism of forgiveness i think that's well, yeah that's ultimately the ticking time bong is it so the idea from what nathan just said is that it's not rational it's right no that's my yeah oh sorry it's i misunderstood though, you he describes it as I mean, he, he places it next to sort of folklore which is the collective mythology and religion, which is, a, you know, another way of approaching uh, yourself and, and your past. And this thing, which is supposed to, which, you know, they described as basically taking the wheel of history and bending it to their will. And they were supposed to be able to, or what they believed that they were doing was removing all that was bad about religion, all that was bad about the past and building something perfect. And basically what happens is they remove all the good that came with religion, all the good that came with folklore, and you were just left with the dregs. Exactly, yeah. When something becomes too rational, too structured, and it's missing specifically that that mechanism of, like, you know, if you fuck up in Christianity, you can tell someone, and they'll forgive you, and then you come back in. But in this structure, once you've fucked up, they kick you out. And you're done. There's no There's no path for you to resolve that. And so, yeah, what I was trying to get at is, like, that thing to me has an excellent parallel. It's why a lot of these concepts sort of sort of transcend just like a historical setting is that honestly, that's kind of a thing that we're missing like in the US right now. We like, we uh, kick people out and then we don't have a mechanism. We don't have confession. We don't have secular confession to allow people back in, right? And it seems so rational. You're like, of course, this person did blank. They're terrible. I don't ever want to do blank right but the reason christianity and all this stuff has survived and been such a like a comfort and all uh, over you know generations is that it has a path for people to pay their penance and to come back into the fold and i think that's like a a large part of like what kundera kind of outlines with kostka which is that is like kind of pointing out almost hilariously how how oddly irrational such a rational structure becomes Hmm. Yeah. The, outside of the forgiveness aspect, they're incredibly similar. And maybe we read this quote before, but there's a quote, I'm reminded by analogy of the enormous power of Christianity. And here he's talking about in relation to the party and its, and its system. I'm reminded by a analogy of the enormous power of Christianity to convince the believer of his fundamental and never ending guilt. And this is about how once you're removed, that's you, you, it never leaves you. And this is sort of what motivates him to, to sort of hold on to this anger and this, this sense of wanting revenge up until it finally explodes in a dud at the end of the book, right? But there's this, <laughs> there's this, there's this never-ending guilt within him because there is no redressal and there's no way to explain right. a joke. <laughs> <laughs> I think he also talks about the, uh, in terms of that never-ending guilt uh, I think it was in the quote that we read at the very beginning that they believed that be to belong to the party was not a matter of choice. It was a matter of essence. Yeah. Either right. you were at your core a communist or you were at your core not, which very Calvinistic. also translates very, very well into, Cal <laughs> into, into the yeah. Calvinist branch of Christianity, which I was more or less raised in. Like, God has either chosen you or not. But, I mean, there's no way to really actually know. So – until your actions reveal yourself as the horrible, <laughs> dirty, rotten person that you are. You don't get no, like a you, Calvinism certificate? <laughs> yeah. It's like notarized? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, we see yeah, papers. yeah. I mean, you get, you get up to the pearly gates and then you, and then you find out. But I think that there's, there's a sense of, do I belong? Do I belong or not? And there's no answer to that. So you have to just pretend that you belong. You have to do your best to pretend that you belong to it, to try to convince yourself and to try to convince everybody else that you do belong. 
because you're convinced that everybody else knows that they belong. You're the only one who's not convinced. Mm -hmm. That is such a pernicious thing in ideology, in any ideology, the idea that you either belong or you don't. You're either one of us or you're against us is like this mentality, Mm -hmm. you know, and this is throughout time. Uh Even today, you see this sort of nonsense. You're either... You're either for this or you're against it, and there is no in the middle. Because any hint of irony, of joke, of playfulness, of not being one of whatever it is, then you're out. You're done. You're shunned. Yeah, and that's the horrifying thing. Yeah. What about love? What about it? Because I I think, you know, we haven't really talked about this, but this is another major theme in the book. It's either a love or anti-love story. And Ludwig's incapacity to love anybody, and Lucy's incapacity to love anybody as well. Um, well, this is where we can get into whether or not you want to read the personal as political. Is has the system ruined this sort of idea for these people, or is it a result of where they these people are and what what's happening, or is it personal? Is it just character? Well, I, I mean, I guess actually, you know. <laughs> I, I didn't. I didn't think about this until just now. But you look at the character of Jaroslav, Jaroslav um, and he thinks he loves his wife, but he actually loves the symbol that she represents to him of the of peasant the girl, girl, the poor yeah. peasant girl. Right. What was it? The farm girl. Peasant girl. I can't. Remember he kind of rescues. Yeah. Uh, in this sort of fantasy land. Yeah. Yeah. So he like as as long as he can see himself as this playing this role in this classic folklore, and his wife playing this other role, then he's comfortable with it. But as soon as that kind of breaks. He realizes that he's totally alone and that he's never loved her and she doesn't love him. Yeah. And then uh, and then you have Casca also, who seems to be a good person and really genuinely tries to do good and seems to genuinely love uh, Lucy in a mostly platonic way. Yeah. Um, even though he, he judges himself for it. I mean, he we can we can get into a, into a second. But regardless of that, he's totally estranged from his wife, who he doesn't love. And so it's like everybody's kind of, no matter how you're coming at love, it's like, how do you actually love another person? Once you start to lie to yourself, you continue lying. Just never stop. <laughs> it's that simple. Just don't stop. Just keep the image going. Yeah, I, I actually read a lot of those interactions as not political. It was more of back to like the, just the fundamental like human condition, right? It is, I mean... To like fully love someone in all of their changes with all of the stuff swirling around on the outside, politically, uh, historically, all that stuff, like people end up being different, right? And so you can easily just point the finger and say, hey, it's this thing that like they were broken such that they didn't have this capacity. But I think everyone's got some sort of collection of those things. And really it's the, it's almost individual perseverance to be able to like, work through that and make something of that. And I think this is actually where this book to me doesn't have any magical feeling is that there isn't really, is there, is there a successful like example of love in this anywhere? No. Like, yeah, that's, it's completely a student. (laughs) No, I mean, (laughs) you get a sense that she doesn't really like him and he's just going through a midlife crisis. Maybe. I don't know. There's this weird sort of like, (laughs) yeah, if this took place in contemporary America, Pavel would be living in Florida with a convertible. Yeah. Just yeah. kind of like Frost, right Frosted yeah. tips and a Miata. Frosted tips. Oh, yeah. Come on. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, <laughs> that's exactly... I, could, I well, pictured him as I, that. Yeah. The uh, Cadillac Silver communist. Fox. The, the Oh, <laughs> uh, whatever. Yeah. But he's, you know, one of those kind of dudes. And then Ludwig... Ludwig's relationship to women in this book is not good. And uh, it's hard to blame him entirely. In the beginning, he's young and he's just, you know, he, like many young men, whether you want to admit it or not, he kind of just wants to get laid. And he's sort well, of... He, a- he says, he said, there's a great quote about that, uh, where he's like, it's such a strange feeling for a young man that he's so obsessed with the feeling of love that he can't actually focus on the the object of love, the, yeah, yeah. the woman. It's just like he can't even get outside of his own head. Yeah, and then she ends up betraying him. He ends up going to the this sort of prisoner camp, and there he sort of attaches himself to Lucy, 
in a way that is really hard to disassociate from his condition and his where he's trapped, you know, because Lucy is described and is revealed to be the sort of boring, kind of pathetic person. She doesn't have much of a character. She goes to movies to feel better about herself because it allows her to sort of connect to other people's sadness. And she just sort of... And we don't really know her backstory at the time, so it's it's hard to judge her after you learn about what happened to her. But in that moment, there's this sense of that he's just sort of using her as this rope in which he can climb out of his own head mm. because he's trapped where he is. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, he ends up using Helena to seek revenge. So, yeah, I don't, I don't think love is... Well, well what about... You, you had mentioned Costco's relationship with Lucy, which is largely platonic, um, but do, do, can you expound a little bit on maybe the conflict there? Okay, so Lucy ends up leaving the village where she grew up after she was sort of groomed and raped over the period of a year by a local gang and then treated like a terrible person and a whore and a slut by her family and her community. And she ends up running away. The the sort of town where Casca is working as a scientist in a some sort of farm, sort of farm collective. The village people, especially the children, think of this this young girl because there's stories about food going disappearing and there's this sense of her as being like this sort of mythical figure. And then they finally find her. Some people in the village find her. She she becomes a worker on this farm. And for the first time in her life, she has a man treating her well and with respect without a motive to use her either in, physically, essentially. And this relationship is complicated because this is her first relationship with such a man. She develops an attachment to him. And the the man, Kostka, thinks what he's doing is a noble thing, but also recognizes that he actually also wants her. And that troubles him, right? Because he doesn't want to be just another man that wants her and uses her. He actually wants to treat her like a decent human person, an individual. And he sort of, he hates himself for that and ends up leaving, returning back. And that affects Lucy. Eventually, she finds a man, gets married, but of course, she's connected to Casca, moves to where Casca lives, just so she can be near him, because she has this this attachment to him, because I think she views him as a sort of savior figure. Her own marriage is terrible. The, the, her husband is abusive, and yeah, so I, I, I don't really know where any love exists, other than in that relationship, but even in that relationship, it's not it's not a pure thing. It's not which nothing is, and I'm not saying it needs to be, but mm-hmm. it's hard to view that as a loving, I don't know how I would describe it, actually. Yeah. Does, I, mean, I don't know if I explained that well. D- Sorry. Uh, I mean, that, that was excellent summary, and as you recount all that, it, it makes me, I don't know, just remember how bleak so much of the actual subject matter of this book is, right? It's pretty horrifying. Yeah. And I was also just thinking through, I was like, does Kundera... Does he does he treat this subject differently in any of his other books? I was thinking of, you know, Unbearable Lightness of Being. And it's kind of it's kind of built in that same way where it really focuses on the extent to which people have dependence on each other. And, you know, that's also shaped by, you know, political stuff that's happening. I remember that one goes through Prague Spring. Um and yeah, I think um I think maybe there's just an inherent skepticism that Kundera has for the individual like human capability for something like that perhaps in the midst of all of these you know political situations you you could read it like that but I think it's a little bit more of a humanity thing of just at the core like look at these look at these interrelationships that we develop sometimes as a coping mechanism just to hold on to I don't know some level of tenderness or substitution or something where love should be but it's just not there in its full capacity and the more i talk through all of this the more it bums me out <laughs> <laughs> not yeah oh thanks thanks nathan we'll read one of those uplifting non-political books <laughs> yeah um the the ride of the kings which is basically the last section 
uh, where all of our characters converge. Uh, the, the setup is that Yaroslav was the king. It's just like, it's this traditional festival that's still happening now. And it has happened. Nobody actually knows when it started. I picture I it as like a renaissance like, fair back. with big turkey legs and jousting kind of things like that. Something like, like all that. your Dungeons and Dragons friends, they it, would go to it. Yeah, it, it like it got it took on a lot of that imagery from like the medieval ages, but it actually predates that. Anyway, so so it it the king, who's a young man dressed as a woman, is rides through town, and you know there's some rituals that they do, and it was a it was a big event for Yaroslav when he was young. He's he's a folklorist. And now his son is asked to do it as a in order to honor Yaroslav. Um, and it, he talks a lot about how the event's very different because it's uh, you know kind of state sponsored now. It's not the people aren't as into it. In any way, but he's still really excited that his son's doing it. He finds out that it's actually not his son. That his son bailed, took a motorcycle trip to go watch some motorcycle races, and he's trying to figure out who is the king. And he never finds out. Who's the king? That's the question to us? Yeah. I mean, nothing will be rectified. All will be forgotten. Everything is meaningless. Does, does that matter? Happen. <laughs> <laughs> does it matter? I think, it, I think maybe it does. Then uh, I feel like Kundera would have revealed it. Right? But I think that... Who could it be? It, Are you it saying might, it's a character it we know about? To, I think it's Lucy. And whether or not that's just metaphorically it's lucy and and ludwig starts thinking it's lucy he starts oh, imagining yeah, yeah, that's right that I it's lucy that. but he also describes uh i think david you read this quote where he the only thing that is real is a sense of vertigo of, of falling and falling into uh trying to rediscover this meaning and that's i think that's his sort of pursuit of lucy lucy kind of coming in and out of his life represents to him some sort of salvation and looking to this figure, this king, in this event that nobody understands anymore, and he's trying to find Lucy there. It, I, it doesn't totally resolve in my head. Ludwig is is trying to find Lucy in the in the king. Whether or not Lucy is in there is irrelevant. The fact that Ludwig is kind of imagining her in that place is is important in some way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I, it's not. There's literally it doesn't. Mm-hmm matter who's in there but i think it's significant that the sun's not there that that they're looking at this character and that kundir doesn't tell us who it is he doesn't resolve that and i think that that's that's something there's something vital maybe maybe this sense of mystery which is beyond sort of rationality which the event kind of represents as well nobody knows why they do this anymore exactly nobody in the novel knows what it was supposed to mean so we when we read this we don't know the meaning of the veiled king so it's another layer to that. Yeah, just nothing means anything. I think that's the, the argument here. <laughs> it's all empty. Except except that except that tumbling and sense of vertigo. Yeah, I'm sorry. I search for meaning. After we just did that whole like love isn't real thing, I think I've just completely changed my opinion of this book. It's just <laughs> emptiness. Uh, Nobody feels good about it. I also have the cynical vulgar version, so maybe that's just me. <laughs> everything going okay in uh, your personal life there, Nick? <laughs> Well, my life's great. I just, I just oh. uh, put art on top of it that makes me feel bad. <laughs> ah, yes. That's kind of what started this podcast, this particular episode. We wanted to read something. <laughs> we wanted to read something that was sort of somewhat positive, right? Yeah. I mean, this is kind of one of those things that we're always talking about, right? We're always talking about how we're trying to explore these heavier literary works, but we find that a lot of them end up being pretty melancholy heavy, right? And so keep coming back to that as like, is it, is it just what we end up gravitating to or is it the nature of what is defined as that? If it's something that doesn't fit within that gloom, does the greater, uh, I don't know, readership or book market or whatever it is, does it filter that out and stick a different label on it? But then sometimes we'll try to get outside that label and we're like, shit, put me back in the box. (laughs) The three of us are slightly optimistic realists. So there's this sense of like, yeah, for the most part, things are shitty. Not all, not entirely. You know, there's still some Moravian folk jams we can enjoy, right? But there is a lot of shit. 
And if you recognize the joke that we call living, then you're able to enjoy it a little more, I think. Yeah, yeah and I, I, I think that's that's why it's hard to look at, to take seriously and actually enjoy something that's just simply entertaining because to just simply be entertaining, it's like you have to divert your attention from what is real. And if you divert your attention too far from what is real, well, I have a hard time believing or caring. That's why I, that's, I think that's why I find uh, uh, this book kind of exists right there to me. It's like, it doesn't not look directly in the eye of what is real and what is evil, but it doesn't give into it either. Yeah, it still preserves that kind of that naive belief, right? That he yeah. that he kind of gets at in his own foreword. It's that that's the magicalness, I think, is is that belief, right? And it's not even yeah, I like that slightly optimistic realism that like fits right in there. He doesn't yeah, he doesn't expect anything's gonna be totally different, but there is just some like needing to not completely give up. Yes. And and I think the fact that there is this critique of in this case, it happens to be communism, but there's a sense of critique in a lot of the works that we read of aspects of living. The reason those critiques exist is because they want to preserve something that is essentially positive about humanity and being an individual in such a, a sort of crazy world. Like there's this sense of you can critique it because you haven't given into it. You're not totally apathetic yet. Thanks for listening. As always, you can find us at booksofsomesubstance.com and on Twitter and Instagram with the handle booksosubstance. I'm just going to make it up and 69.